Hi everyone and welcome to Biology Professor. Today we're going to be talking about selenocysteine and pyrolysine. These are sometimes called the 21st and 22nd protogenic amino acids. So let's talk about what that means. Basically there are hundreds of known amino acids that have different functions in biology, but only 22 of them are what is known as proteinogenic. This means that they are incorporated into proteins during the process of translation. Now, of these 22, there are 20 that you're probably already really familiar with. Those are part of the standard genetic code, sometimes called the universal genetic code. Um, you've probably seen that table where you've got all of the triplet codons that shows you what each triplet codon, which uh, amino acid it codes for. So those are the 20 that we're talking about here. Now there's two more. And those are the subject of today's video, that is selenocysteine and pyrolysine. And those are incorporated still during translation, but via special translation mechanisms. So they're not part of that standard genetic code. Now let's take a look at what these two amino acids look like. We'll talk about the one that's typically numbered as number 21 first, that's selenocysteine. This is what selenocysteine looks like. So just to help orient you, We've got our alpha carbon right there. Remember the alpha carbon in an amino acid is attached to four things. You've got the amino group, the hydrogen, the carboxyl group, and the R group. And in selenocysteine, this right here is the R group. It's known as a selenol group, and it might look familiar to you. The CH2, um, selenium, and then hydrogen, this right here is very similar to the R group in cysteine, except that in cysteine, instead of a selenium, you have a sulfur, that cysteine is the one that makes the disulfide bridges you might be familiar with. But in selenocysteine, we've got a selenium here instead. This um, selenium is very, very important. It's actually an essential dietary micronutrient, meaning that our bodies cannot make it. We have to ingest it in our diet. And the reason it's so essential is because selenocysteine, this amino acid right here, is used in selenoproteins. So selenoproteins are just proteins that have selenocysteine in them. Um, selenoproteins in general have a lot of very important functions in the brain. If this is something that you're interested in, you can go check out um, mercury poisoning. The reason that we worry about mercury levels um, and taking in, you know, eating too much, say fish that has mercury in it sometimes, is because that mercury can bind up selenoproteins and keep them from working effectively. Um, selenocysteine is found in all three domains, but not in all lineages. It means that there are certain groups of organisms in these domains that don't actually use selenoproteins, but humans are certainly ones that do use selenoproteins and thus have to make selenocysteine. When we are referring to selenocysteine using the, the three-letter abbreviation for amino acids, it's SEC, using the one-letter abbreviation, U is the one-letter abbreviation that has been designated for selenocysteine. Now we'll move on to number 22. And remember we're talking about number 22 of these 22 protogenic, um, proteinogenic amino acids. So this one right here is pyrolysine. You can see it's a little bit more complicated. We've still got our alpha carbon right there. The alpha carbon still has its amino group, its hydrogen, its carboxyl group. This right here is the R group. So you have four CH2 groups and then a nitrogen. And this probably looks familiar to you as well. This is what lysine would look like, except lysine has two hydrogens connected to this nitrogen. And in pyrolysine, one of those hydrogens has been replaced with this right here, 
which is a pyroline group. And so this is pyrolysine. It is not as common throughout living organisms as selenocysteine. It's most well known for being used in some methanogens. Methanogens being um, a type of extremophile bacterium. It's not used in humans at all. It's three letter abbreviation is PYL and it's one letter abbreviation is O. So now that we know a little bit more about selenocysteine and pyrolysine, let's talk about how they actually get incorporated in translation. In other words, what are their special translation mechanisms? Well, it turns out that they are both coded for by stop codons. So if you have studied biology for a while, you'll know that there are three different stop codons and those are codons that when the um, ribosome gets to, to a stop codon during translation, it stops the translation process. Typically that means that the, uh, the protein is complete and can be released. But in these special circumstances, there can be a stop codon that instead of being interpreted as a stop codon, is interpreted as being for a pyrolysine or a selenocysteine instead. And so pyrolysine is encoded by UAG and selenocysteine is encoded by UGA. And so those are the codons that are typically stop codons, but in certain cases, which we'll go over right here, they can instead direct the cell to incorporate a pyrolysine or a selenocysteine instead. So we'll talk about the pyrolysine one first. They, um, organisms that use pyrolysine, like methanogens, for example, have a special gene cluster. So this is a grouping of genes. It's called the, um, the PYL or pyl TSBCD gene cluster. These code for some special enzymes and those special enzymes help the translation machinery recognize UAG as requiring a pyrolysine to be incorporated instead of recognizing it as a stop codon. Selenocysteine is encoded um, even in a different way. And so encoded by that UGA codon, it would usually be a stop codon, but there is a special kind of structure. It's about 60 nucleotides long called a selenocysteine insertion sequence or CSIS in the mRNA before the, uh, the UGA codon. And so basically what that looks like is you've got about 60, um, nucleotides in the mRNA, and they form a, a sort of special stem, what's called a stem loop structure, right before that UGA codon. And the presence of this structure, this right here being the, the selenocysteine insertion sequence, tells the cell, hey, don't read this as a stop codon, read it as requiring a selenocysteine to be incorporated at that place. And so that is what the cell will do in those circumstances. If you're interested in learning more about the standard universal genetic code, check out my video on the genetic code. If you're interested in um, the way that mRNA gets modified, particularly post-transcriptionally modified, then you can also check out my videos on post-transcriptional modifications to see what other modifications the cell makes to its mRNA prior to translation. So that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed watching and thanks for watching Biology Professor.